I'm an incredibly lucky person. My parents, both of them, were in vivacious readers. They wanted to learn. Up until they died, they were taking college classes. My father, after he got his law degree, accumulated enough credits for three PhDs. He was so hungry to learn. My grandfather sat, or rather lied, on his bed with his magnifying glass, trying to learn five new words a day. He already knew six languages. So I was marinated, marinated in this curiosity. I was hungry to learn and emulate them. And then I discovered Socrates during my adolescence. Socrates was a pretty amazing guy. Socrates went all over Athens asking these provocative questions. In fact, he was a real pesky guy, too, because he'd ask questions that people didn't quite know the answers to. One of my favorite stories about Socrates is referred to as the Oracle of Delphi. It went something like this. Socrates, you're the wisest man in Athens. And he said, get out of here. That's ridiculous. And the Oracle said, yes, of course. You're the wisest man in Athens. Go check it out. So he went all over Athens asking this person and that person. And this person said, oh, of course I'm wise. Can't you see all these people lined up to hear what I have to say? Another guy says, people quote me all the time. Another person said, they pay me to spout my wisdom. Do they pay you? And Socrates said, no, no, of course, no, of course not. And he went away thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. Everybody thinks they're wise. Am I not the only person in Athens that recognizes my own ignorance? Hey, maybe that is wisdom. So I took that curiosity, and I knew that I needed to develop a career. I mean, I needed to pay the bills. I needed to help people because uh, my family went through this terrible genocide. I was always very curious about how people survived. So, and I like to ask questions. So, hmm, maybe I'll be a psychologist. So I've been a psychologist for roughly about 40 years and I developed a big training program and we had to develop the state of art. You know, what is the state of art for helping people with their mental health? So we went all over the place. We were searching for the pearls of wisdom, the evidence-based practices, and there was a blizzard, literally a blizzard, of schools of psychotherapy. They all thought they had the kernel on the, you know, they, they knew what was going on. They had the language, they had the secret handshakes, they had the card-carrying membership. You could be a level four this and that. Oh, God, I can tell you I was sick of it. <laughs> I was sick of these assumed wise people. And, you know, it turns out that the 21st century is dramatically different from the 20th century. We don't need any gurus of any clubs. I certainly don't want to be a guru of some sort of club of psychotherapy. What they were all working for was to help you develop some lifestyle practices that would help you on multiple levels. And I put them into the mnemonic seeds, so you can remember them. You plant seeds, cultivate seeds over a lifetime, you'll be a whole lot happier, you won't suffer from depression, anxiety, and stress, and later in life you might not get the symptoms of dementia early, and so what are they? Well, social is the first one. Social means, in a sense, having vibrant, mutually compassionate, reciprocal relationships. First E is exercise. And what I mean by exercise is it's an aerobic boost every single day. You've got to get your heartbeat moving. And you've got to do it for at least 30 minutes a day. Come back, sweat, everything. You've got to do it. Sitting around is really the, mo the world's disaster, really. I mean, many people are now saying sitting is the new smoking. The second E is education. 
It's the curiosity, it's the Socrates, it's asking questions and it's building a body of knowledge. And the D is diet. You know, frankly, in the Western world, we're eating a lot of crap right now and we're destroying our bodies and our brains. So simply speaking, what you need to do is cut out the simple carbohydrates and the fried foods and you'll be a whole lot healthier because you need to build the neurochemistry to get your brain functioning and sleep. Sleep isn't just one thing. There's a sleep architecture that you've got to maintain. And how do you do it? You don't mess it up with all sorts of chemicals, either illicit or prescribed. So these five healthy factors have a huge body of neuroscience literature behind them to support them. So let me run through some of the basics here. This is the big bang of the 21st century, this integration. Integration is really where we're headed together because it's multidisciplinary. Everything starts with energy. Every one of your cells have these little energy factories that we call mitochondria. You don't have to remember that word, but just remember every one of your cells have these little energy factories and they produce ATP. And if you don't do that, you die. And how do you do that? You've got to feed these energy factories by your diet, your breathing, and you've got to use that energy by exercise. Heck, yeah, I just talked about two seeds factors right there. And your genome doesn't get activated without energy. And you've got an immune system throughout your body and your brain. So you've got to keep these energy factories going so you can get your immune system taking care of you rather than fighting against you. And you need continuity. You need to know where you've been so you don't mess up and do the same thing you did before. You need a memory system and there are multiple levels of it. And then you also need these states of mind that we've been confused by for a long time. Do you know that in my field, we have been arguing about what the mind is for a century. Everybody's got a different definition of what the mind is. And you know why we've been having such a difficult time? Because there is no one thing called the mind. And in fact, what we have is states of mind that you go through as you're sitting here listening to me right now, you've been through states of mind that collectively we call the mind. And what are these states of mind? Well, there's a whole bunch of them. But in recent years, we've sort of centered on three really very clear ones. You have one called the salience network, one called the executive network, and one called the default mode network. So what are these? Well, let's take the salience network. It's your sense of material me. It's you within your own body. Even your gut bacteria has an effect on how you feel, your gut feelings, your sense of pleasure or displeasure, your sense of connecting with another person, feeling a sense of love or anxiety. The salience network is giving you a sense of motivation and emotion. Now notice the word emotion. It's motion with a sense of feeling about where you're moving to. And then there's the executive network. Now I'm an avid skier and I know, especially at my age now, that if I don't pay attention to every single moment, I could run into a tree. And it's really difficult to pay attention to every single moment. In fact, we know that this area of the brain called the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, kind of a fancy term for top to the side, is the last to mature in your brain. In fact, some of you here are now just maturing this area of your brain because it's the mid-20s women before men, 
And it's the last area to mature, but it's the first area to go. And you've got to cultivate this activity on a regular basis. Or you start to make mistakes. Maybe the first part of your sentence might not be connected to the last part of your sentence if your executive network isn't operative. Roughly 20 to 30 seconds. Hopefully the next 20 to 30 seconds relates to the previous 20 to 30 seconds. And then there's the default mode network. You've been in and out of there since I've been talking. We spend 30% of our waking hours some other place, thinking about something that happened last night, what you hope to eat for dinner, who you should be texting in a couple minutes. You're always thinking about this, that, and the other thing. And it gives us the capacity to wonder what's going on in another person's mind. In fact, this area of the brain develops roughly about age four, five, six, when we start to interact and look at another person and wonder what they're thinking. Now, we could do a lot of creative things with our default mode network. In fact, another favorite guy that I just love to read about is Einstein. And Einstein said that my gift of fantasy is worth more to me than all the accumulated knowledge. So you well know that he developed the theory of relativity by fantasizing sitting on a, a light beam. Well, we can also do some not so good things with the default mode network. We can do some stinking thinking with the default mode network. We can ruminate about stuff that happened before, maybe two years before, and you're still thinking about it. And we know that people that are depressed have a tendency to be stuck and elongate their default mode network. So you do this cycle all the time. You go through all these states of mind that we collectively call the mind. And in fact, what are you doing right now? Are you in your default mode network? Are you doing anything creative? Are you having some insightful thought? Are you doing stinking thinking or worrying about something? What you do there has a lot to say about your mental health. And so we've got to keep these areas of the brain, keep these states of mind in balance with one another, because if we don't, what happens? We have mental health problems. So guys like me spend a whole lot of time helping you Keep them in balance so you don't spend a whole lot of time worrying about stuff you don't need to worry about, bemoaning something that is long since gone. You need to balance these mental states of mind. The five healthy factors that have all this research behind them are easy to remember. Remember, they're the seeds. The five healthy factors, you've got to connect, have regular connections on a regular basis daily, exercise daily to get that aerobic boost, learn something new. I feel malnourished if I don't learn something new every single day. And you need to feed your energy systems with a balanced diet. Sort of a mix between the Mediterranean and the Okinawan diet. A really good example of that is so-called mind diet. And you need to have clean sleep. What I mean by that is not only not complicated by all these chemicals, but also many of us look at computer screens late at night. It's tricking the brain to think that it's daytime, and you create insomnia like that. So there's a whole variety of techniques that we call sleep hygiene to keep you getting clean sleep. So there's been a lot of research on contemplative practices and these mental operating networks in recent years, meaning focusing on mindfulness and and different types of meditation. And what it is about is you cycling through. A good friend of mine is a Tibetan Lama, and the whole concept of the default mode network is the pause. And then you're back to feeling again. And then you're back to focusing, and then pff, you're out there pausing again. So this interaction 
is what you do all the time, but you can get it in better rhythm. We call that mental health. And in fact, what we also know is that the major religions, all of them, come down to a couple basic ideas. And these basic ideas are interdependence. In other words, we're connected and we depend on one another. And you know what? In the years to come, we really have to depend on one another because of climate change and many, many more pandemics coming down the pipe. And compassion. In fact, many people call it love. Love your neighbor. Even love your enemy. Wow, that's a hard thing to do. And actually, when you can express compassion, when you can feel compassion, it is the most powerful feeling you could possibly have. And you know, Socrates was all about all of this. He asked questions, he exuded compassion, he cared about other people, and he knew there was an interdependence among us all. But most of all, he was a curious person. He was constantly learning, and the very fact that he didn't know everything was motivation to keep learning. Thank you.